Good morning and happy Easter from Chelmsford Bible Church. I'm Ryan, the pastor of Chelmsford Bible Church, and I know this is super different. This is super weird for me as well. Now, this is the first time that I can remember where we are not going to be in church on Easter Sunday, and it's just crazy. But you know what? Uh, Easter is not canceled. You know, this virus did not put Jesus back in that tomb. Easter is not canceled. The tomb is still empty. Jesus has risen, and he has risen indeed, and we praise God for that. But this year, obviously, has not started out the way we had hoped. And throughout this crisis that we've been going through, there are a lot of people living in fear, living in stress, living with anxiety. But there is still hope. But people are still worried that this crisis will cause even more problems that will last longer than the virus itself will. And people are searching. I think we're all searching for anything that we can cling to in order to get us through this stress, through this crisis. As followers of Jesus, we know where our hope is found. Our hope is not determined by what is happening now or what will happen tomorrow. Our hope is determined by what has already happened. Our hope is found in Jesus and the fact that he left that tomb empty. The life we are experiencing now, it fades. It's perishable. Each day that goes by brings us closer to the end. Whether that end is the end of the world or more realistically, the end of our lives here on this earth. But we don't have to fear either end because we know that either end is not the end for us. It's just the beginning because of Jesus. In this last part of, in this last message of this series, Magnum Opus, we're going to look and we're going to talk about the kind of culmination of God's masterpiece and what that means for us even today. In this last part of, of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to read the words of Paul that he wrote to a church that was putting too much hope in the here and now. Does that sound familiar? We put a lot of hope in the here and now, but that's not where we should put our hope in. They were putting too much trust in the present rather than resting in the promises the empty tomb could solidify for them and can solidify for us today. Easter should be a reminder for us to rest in the promises of that empty tomb. The empty tomb reminds us that this life is not it. The empty tomb reminds us that the victory is already won. The empty tomb reminds us that all of the promises of God are yes and amen. So in 1 Corinthians 15, that's where we're going to be in, in starting in verse 50, and we're going to read down through, 50, through verse 57. What we're going to look at is this first point is that his victory is our victory. And this is what Paul writes to the Corinthian church. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, death is a cruel reality, and there's no coming back from it. We, and when we get together and, and at, at funeral services for those that we love and we care about, we mourn because we will never see them again. But will we? Does death have the final say in matters like this? There was a time when Jesus was talking to some religious leaders. And in Mark chapter 12, verses 26 through 27, this is what is recorded. And as for the dead being raised, this is Jesus speaking. Have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. You see, some religious leaders are trying to trap Jesus. Because they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in any kind of afterlife. And they're trying to trap him 
into either agreeing with their views or going off on some other view that they might have deemed heretical. But Jesus, he didn't fall into their trap. And he pointed them back to the scriptures. You see, when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush, Moses was called by God to deliver the ancient Hebrews out of slavery. And when God called Moses in this bush that started burning, but it didn't burn up, and God was speaking to Moses, and he said, I am the God of, of your ancestors, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And what God was saying to Moses is, I'm not the God of the dead, I'm the God of the living. And he told Moses that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, his ancestors, his predecessors, were with God in his presence alive. You see, to deny the resurrection is to admit that death is one. It's to admit that death is one and we are ultimately defeated. And not only us, but that Jesus was defeated too. To deny the resurrection means the life we are living now is actually meaningless. Now, some would argue that this is the only life we get. And so let's live good lives, impacting people along the way in order to make the most of this one shot that we get. Some would live as though they're trying to race death. And what I mean by that is that some want to live their lives to the fullest, experiencing everything that they possibly can so that they have no regrets when they do pass away from this life. Without Christ, this is how we all would live our lives. We would live to fulfill every desire and meet every expectation we have. Some of us would live to make positive impacts on people's lives, while some of us would live for ourselves. But the resurrection shows us a better way. The resurrection calls us to a better life, a life that is raised not to live for ourselves, but to live for a kingdom that is far better than our own. You see, the resurrection, it shouts a clear and bold message to us. Death has been swallowed up in victory, and that sting of death is gone. You know, when you feel that sting of death, when you're at a funeral service, think about those times where you've been at a funeral service, and you feel that sting of death. Well, whenever you feel that sting of death, you know, you know as a follower of Christ, that that sting is gone. We don't need to dwell on that sting. Especially if our loved one knew Jesus and followed Jesus, we will get to see them again. The victory that death thought it had was a delusion. In Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8, the prophet Isaiah says this, He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. You see, the prophet relayed this message from God to God's people who are about to be exiled into a foreign land. The prophet was reminding God's people that there was hope. The resurrection of Jesus declared that this promise from Isaiah was going to be realized, was going to come to fruition. There will come a day when Jesus will return and death will be fully defeated. We still face death now because Jesus hasn't returned yet. When Jesus returns, he's going to take down and say, you are no more. You're done. And we don't have to fear death now because death is only the beginning for us. Death is the way to get us to where God is. And notice from the Isaiah passage how tender God is. That he will one day wipe away every tear. And he will say this thing of death is gone. Death has been completely swallowed up. And the resurrection of Jesus solidifies that promise. The resurrection of Jesus shows us, hey, I just got this ball rolling. I rolled away that, that stone, I walked out of that tomb, and I left it empty to show you that death is done. Death's days are numbered. You see, Jesus won the victory over death, and we share in his victory. We live victorious lives. We are just passing through this wilderness right now. You see, when Moses delivered the Israelites out of Egypt, out of slavery, they had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years before they were able to go into the promised land. We are wandering in the wilderness right now, waiting for the promised land. The promised land is where God is. And Jesus is going to come back one day, and he's going to establish that promised land here, and we get to live with him forever, never having to face death again. So whatever this life throws at us is meaningless. 
Because nothing can change the victory that we have because of Jesus. So how now shall we live? How now should we live knowing the fact that, that tomb is empty, knowing all those promises that are solidified because Jesus left the tomb empty and the hope that we have that is waiting for us? How now shall we live? Well, we need to be unmovable. We need to be unmovable. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the last verse of this chapter, this is what Paul says. Therefore, whenever Paul says therefore, or if there's a thus or a but or anything like that, it's a, it's, a, it's a joining word. It's a conjoining word. It means look at what happened, come, came before this, and now take that into account as you read this verse. So he says, therefore, therefore, death, because death has been swallowed up in victory, and there is no more sting of death, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, we can trust in the hope that awaits us in eternity. We don't have to fear death, and we actually don't, don't even have to fear anything that this world has to throw at us. We don't have to fear anything. People are afraid of this virus right now and its implications, but as believers, we don't have to fear. We can stand in the midst of this chaos in full trust in Jesus. We can be unmovable. Now, does that mean we need to make rash decisions and, and, and dumb decisions? No. We still need to be compassionate followers of Jesus, making sure that we're doing everything we can to honor Christ in everything that we do. But we can be immovable. We don't have to be swayed back and forth. You know, it's like when Jesus was walking on the water. Jesus is walking along. And the, the crazy part of that story, I think, that we miss, the details about that story that we, I think we miss, is that Jesus is walking on this water, and it's not calm water. There is a massive storm that has arisen. And it's so bad that even the disciples are in this boat, and they're freaking out. They're worried. And these are disciples, some of whom are fishermen. At least three of them, Peter, James, and John, they're fishermen. They grew up with storms all the time as they were fishing. And Jesus is just walking on this water as calm as he can be. And then, not only are they freaked out about this storm, now they're seeing a guy walking on the water and they think it's a ghost. And Jesus says, don't be afraid, it's just me. And then Peter says, if it's you, Lord, tell me to come out there too. And so Peter starts walking, and then here's, the, here's what happened. Peter's walking on the water, which is just crazy. But as soon, and it says this in the scripture passage, as soon as he sees the wind and the waves, he starts sinking immediately. Because he lost his focus on Jesus. When he, was, when he put his eyes on Jesus, he was unmovable. He didn't notice the wind and the waves. He didn't notice the storm. He forgot all about it. He was unmovable. But then when he took his eyes off Jesus... He became movable again, and he sank, and he said, Jesus, save me. You see, we can be unmovable because of Jesus. We're going to struggle with frustrations and fears. We're going to struggle with anxiety and worry. We, we've been struggling. I'm sure we've been struggling right now in the midst of this crisis. I know I have. There's been days, there's been moments where I have. But when we struggle, we have the Holy Spirit inside of us to remind us where hope is. He will lovingly remind us that our hope is found in Jesus, not in this world. You see, regardless of what happens in this life, nothing can change our relationship with Jesus. Nothing changes our assurance in Jesus. You know, we sing that song sometimes, that, that great hymn, Blessed Assurance, and that, that hymn is so true because it speaks so much truth about who, the assurance that we have that is found only in Christ. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 through 15, it says this, Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Each day brings us closer to Jesus. Each day makes us more mature in our walk with Christ if we allow that Holy Spirit 
to continue to work in us, to continue to mold us and shape us to become even more unmovable. Are we going to be movable at times? Yes. Peter was a disciple of Jesus. He sank in the water as soon as he took his eyes off Jesus. Do we do the same thing that Peter did? Yes, we take our eyes off Jesus. We become movable. Peter said, I won't deny you, Jesus. There's no way. I'll even die with you. Even if everybody else leaves you, I'll die with you. Peter denied Christ three times because he took his eyes off Jesus. He became movable. As long as we keep our eyes on Jesus, we can be unmovable. The Holy Spirit will give us that power to do so. And that is because Jesus is no longer on the cross. Jesus is no longer in that tomb. The tomb is empty. We can live the resurrected life. Regardless of what happens in this life, nothing changes our assurance in Jesus. So in closing, his victory is our victory. We walk in victory because of Jesus. And we need to be unmovable because of that. Because of the empty tomb, we can be unmovable. And that's what Easter is all about.